Welcome back to the State for Performance podcast. Now, as normal, I'm always joined by people whose names I cannot pronounce. So today I'm joined by Madeline, and that's your cue, Madeline, to pronounce your second name, your surname. My second name is Spracer. Spracer. So just a silent J. <laughs> oh, a silent J. So Spracer. Okay, that was easier yeah. than some of the other ones. Well, I seem to have this knack for inviting people onto the podcast where I can't pronounce their name. <laughs> you're not the only one don't worry <laughs> and then i get mad when people mispronounce my name i'm like how do you call me duncan it's dunican there's an i in there and then i get mad but i'm the, I'm the worst person for mispronouncing names <laughs> so madeline um where are you joining us from today whereabouts in the world are you uh i'm in adelaide adelaide in south australia that's it the home of the great white shark <laughs> yes <laughs> did you want to uh, <laughs> and good wine as well that's right yeah do you, you, you do you partake in any uh swimming with sharks or wine drinking uh more on the wine side <laughs> than the shark side personally excellent so madeline um can you give us a little bit of background on yourself uh where did you grow up and uh, what were you interested in as a kid going to school uh well i grew up in adelaide um lived here most of my life lived for a couple of years in melbourne but from here living here currently um, what I was interested in as a kid, um, I was a nerd in school. I was interested in most of my subjects. Uh, I did history and psychology uh, in high school. Um, okay. And that sort of started my interest in psych uh, when I did it in year 11 and 12, um, and then went on to do it at uni as well. Interesting. So that's an interesting combination of people to enjoy history and psychology. What, what, was, what were the sort of um, the common ground or the similarities that you've seen between those two subjects? Both of them have an element of why people do things. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of why I was interested in history in high school was figuring out why these historical events happened. And I think the same thing applies to psychology. Why are people doing the things they do? Yeah. And when you were, um, when you were studying history, uh, what kind of period of history were you most interested in? Uh, I mostly studied modern European history. So, oh, oh. yeah, I remember doing a lot of um, World War II, but also... Uh, like French Revolution and Russian Revolution, things like that. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of, I like that era as well. Yeah, I like um, sort of 1900 to about, you know, modern times in, in, in Europe as well. I'm a big fan of World War II. So I'm like one of those old, sad, middle-aged men on the History Channel, World War II documentaries on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Have you, ever, have you ever read any of Anthony B. Vore's books? No, I haven't. He's very good. I think originally he might have been a military officer and he just started writing. He's not a historian, but he's very, very good. Uh, he's written a book called Dida. He's written a book called Stalingrad, uh, Berlin, uh, Anthony Bivor, B W E V O R. Again, I could be pronouncing that wrong. He's <laughs> he's he's very British. Um, he's been on the ABC radio a few times talking about some of his books. Um, his Dida book is quite interesting because nearly every chapter alternates one from the side of the Allies and then the other from the side of um, the the Germans. So you're constantly getting this kind of what was happening you know, two days out, three days out from data on both sides. And it's quite kind of interesting. And mm, that is very interesting. And he also writes very objectively. He's not, he doesn't kind of get that. I feel like sometimes in, in some of the history books or documentaries, we get this very uh, emotive, you know, the West was good and, you know, the Germans were bad. And we get that kind of flavor in it. Or Anthony Bivore just writes factually about what was happening. Um, but in yeah. an interesting style as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. I feel like that's such an um, important perspective to take, like just thinking about my own background. So you mentioned my last name. Um, so my background on my dad's side of the family is Croatian. And so my Dida, my grandpa, was in the war and uh, for Croatia, obviously, so they're you know not on the Allied team. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's just super interesting to hear about, you know, what his experiences were in the war because I think being from countries that weren't Germany but still on that side... Uh, it's just a whole different perspective. Yeah, yeah, completely, yeah. And I think um, that's what worries me sometimes in today's world where, oh, that was bad, we should get rid of that statue or get rid of this or get rid of that book. It's like, well, shouldn't we look at it so we can learn from it? But then I look, look back even at Roman history and you think when the, when the Roman Empire declined, you know, and the Catholic Church emerged from the Roman Empire, that was done as well, you know? Yeah. So I it's, it's been done forever. I think there's a difference between learning from the past and glorifying it, though. I think that's an important distinction to make. Hundred percent, I totally agree with that. I think that's a really that's a really important point. That is, uh, yeah, is learning from it and not glorifying it. And then there's also 
that's where it does become problematic when people go back and kind of reharvest the past to glorify it, to fuel a new wave of that. Yeah, you know, like exactly. the fort, the fort right type of thing, or people use that as a method to go justify their new offshoot in a different direction. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a great start to a sleep podcast discussing <laughs> yeah. World War II history. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, Anthony B. Moore's books are really good if you want to check them out. If you have a secondhand bookshop in Adelaide, you'll probably see some of them floating around there. Um, they're nice and big and chunky as well, so it's re- they're really good. Anyway, so you did history and psychology um, yeah. at high school. And then what did, uh, what did you study at uni? Was it psychology? Yeah, well, I actually started uh, with law and arts. I started doing a double degree and I got one semester into law and then decided that that was plenty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'd done psychology as uh, electives in my arts component of the degree. Um, so I swapped out of law and into psych for second year. Uh-huh. I, I've got yeah. a few friends who studied law as well, but actually went through and did a whole degree, then got jobs as, as lawyers or graduate lawyers and left within six, six weeks, six months. So at least you had the good fortune to get out early uh, and, and, uh, and learn from it. It's, it's, it's um, yeah, I think it's got a, from, well, this is just my experience. There's lots of people I know who studied law. Just, you know, it's not like to see on TV or like, I'm not working in that industry. <laughs> Yeah, I just remember people telling me, oh, well, you're good at arguing, so you'll be good at law. And then I realized it was a lot more reading than it was arguing. So Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah. another thing is where you hear people saying, oh, law has got hardly any contact hours. Yeah, but it's got like hundreds of reading hours. So you're not going yeah. to gonna wing it like and get through, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a friend who recently um, left her law career uh, to go and study winemaking. So I feel oh. like that's a, a good call. <laughs> Yeah, winemaking, that's yeah, very processed. That's another thing as well that people think is very just, you know, yeah, I'll just make wine and have a good time. It's very process oriented and quality driven. It's like nearly like metallurgy. I know some people are in the coffee business, same thing as well. So like quality control and think, oh, wow, it's not just sipping lattes and having fun and giggling. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually quite complex, yeah. Although she does get to spend quite a bit of time drinking the wine and also hanging out at wineries. So, you know, that sounds pretty appealing to me. It's not, it's not too bad, Madeline. I suppose in the sleep world, we get to watch people sleep, which is just equally uh, equally as cool and creepy, but at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah, I say that uh, I like sleeping so much, I did a whole PhD on it. <laughs> um, and so when you were growing up, Madeline, and you were picking those subjects, what uh, you obviously said you, you studied law and arts. What, what did you foresee your career to be, you know, when you were like 16, chewing on your pencil, looking out the window, someday I'll be a, what did you think? Oh, I had no idea. No idea. I, yeah, I had no idea. But uh, funnily enough, my mother is also a sleep researcher or really? was when I was growing up. So I was a little bit exposed to the sleep field even way back then. Oh, fascinating. And did yeah. she work at a university doing research or was she a lab tech or what What, what capacity was, was she? Uh, she did her PhD and worked um, at UniSA for a while. Oh. Um, and then she recently just retired from being the fatigue specialist at uh, Shell. What's your mother's name? Angela Baker. <laughs> I know Angela. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> there you go. I did, obviously different last name, so I was like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think Angela worked at um, Rio Tinto for a while when I was there. That's right. Okay. There we go. We should have had a wait, see. There you go. You have to be very careful what you say on this podcast and who's who. <laughs> so, yes, because Angela was originally and was she a nurse? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There you go. Small world, small world. It really yeah. is. It really I, th- is. I, th- I thought you said when she retired from Shell recently, I thought you were going to say Terry Lillington. Do you know Terry? No, yeah, I do know Terry. Yeah. 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 No, but yeah. They work together quite closely. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, very good. So there you go. That's the thing about sleep, everybody. If you want to get in, it's nepotism. It's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> <laughs> Too small of a world. Uh, yeah, did, did, your, did your mother uh, see your recent talk when you were discussing sexual activity on the Sleep for Performance seminar last year? Uh, no, she didn't actually. I should get her to watch it though. <laughs> <laughs> Some people messaged me when you did that talk last year. I know this is science, but it's really weird to hear somebody talk about sleep and masturbation <laughs> and sex and all these things. It just feels a bit wrong. <laughs> I was, I was getting these what? messages to the side. I was just kind of giggling away. Hopefully it piqued their interest, at least. I think a lot of people were interested. Yeah, you probably had the highest tune-in rate for that one. <laughs> <laughs> we will put a link to the show notes if you want to go and have a look at that uh, talk that Madeline did last year. 
Anyway, we digress. We talk about family, we talk about history, we talk about sex. Let's get into this paper. Uh, Madeleine, you recently uh, published uh, an excellent uh, review called How Effective Are Fatigue Risk Management Systems, in brackets, FRMS, a review. Um, and it was published in the Accident Analysis and Prevention. How would you describe an FRMS, Madeleine? What, what is it and where do we use it? Uh, well, I guess I would describe, uh, describe FRMS as a sort of set of data-driven principles uh, to manage fatigue uh, within an organisational setting. So a key part of that is using a risk-based approach as opposed to a prescriptive approach. So, um, you know, a lot of organisations using a prescriptive approach will have simply a limitation on how many hours you can work in a row or how many hours you can work in a week, and that's sort of how they're managing fatigue in inverted commas. Um, uh, as opposed to an FRMS, which is a sort of a multi-layered system which looks at um, the likelihood of fatigue, the consequences of that fatigue, and actually does risk assessments to determine appropriate control measures. Um, in addition to that, uh, also looking at things like uh, monitoring and evaluation, so continually um, taking in data and figuring out, okay, well, what is uh, is what we're doing actually working, um, making sure that the policy and governance aligns with that, uh, training and education components. So there are all these components, um, but essentially the key is that sort of risk-based framework. Risk-based framework, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, what kind of industries, Madeleine, would be using FRMS? Uh, mostly industries that um, use shift work and have fatigue as sort of a, a significant hazard. Um, so a lot of what we found in this review um, is that sort of the main industries where we look at FRMS are things like uh, industries like the transport industry, um, aviation, and also healthcare. Um, in addition to that, though, you know, we see FRMSs or components of FRMSs in other industries where shift work is used. So things like emergency services, you're going to see FRMSs uh, potentially as well. Yeah, and I think you also see it then in, um, in, in mining, oil and gas, um, yeah. You know, which said there's all emergency services, utilities, all all these groups. But I think what's yeah. interesting is people say to have an FRMS, and when you scratch the top of the uh, of the itch and you see below, they actually just have a, a couple of policies or documents or a couple of things that to, to do. It's not really truly an FRMS, as you, as you alluded to. It's uh, or described. It's a kind of a multi dimensional process of lots of different things happening that is risk based, based upon data. You know, continually evolving. It's not just a set of like rules, as in. Um, you know, thou shalt not work more than 10 hours a day for four days in a row, you know? Yeah, and no, I, I totally agree. And it's, it's interesting because you look into it a bit more and there are some uh, organisations and industries that use the term fatigue risk management systems or FRMS, but they're not actually referring to what you and I would probably consider to be an FRMS. They're more saying, okay, well, we're managing the risk by limiting the hours of work yes. rather than by using a risk assessment process. Yeah, and I, I said to I said to people for that response as well. When I'm working with businesses or in any research capacity, what you have there is a is a procedure or a policy or a document that you know basically is prescriptive, and it's the first level in terms of risk uh, fatigue risk management maturity. You need you may need elements of that to get some stability, but it's not a truly a fatigue risk management system. It's a, yeah. it's compliance based really or kind of rules based. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's sort of where we ended up um, with this review, talking about the potential for that sort of prescriptive, prescriptive side of things to be integrated to a certain degree with the risk-based uh, components of FRMS as well. So we're seeing more and more that um, sort of these hybrid models are maybe a bit more appealing for some organisations where they can kind of do both. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing because I, I, would, uh, I would agree with that from a practical standpoint. It's very hard for a company to go from, if we look at lots of companies, they will look straight away to local legislation from a federal, state, or regional level. They look at industry bodies and they will kind of, that's where they'll start looking like, what do I have to do? What's the guidance? You know, what's the, what's the kind of best practice? And they'll very much will look to government and regulatory sources initially for that and try and get this kind of the outer sketch or the shape of what they have to do. And I think if you don't have that or you don't develop a set of um, some you need some element of prescriptive guidelines. And what I call them is like, they're nearly like an outer boundary fence. You need to have those markers in there and go, look, we can't really go past a hundred hours a week. For example, we can't be doing six weeks continuous night shift. We can't have people starting at 3am and starting at 3pm and finishing at 3pm. These are the things we know 
from research and government and so on. It might be very prescriptive by the government, but here's what we know. So here's our outer boundaries. And then we can start building the, um, the system within that kind of color in between the lines. Um, so it's really interesting to say that because I think from a practical standpoint of view, businesses like that, because then it's not so vague and wishy-washy and people don't have the maturity to keep adapting to data like that. So they need a bedrock to build from prescriptive compliance into, you know, out of the reactive phase into the more proactive phase and then get into the more the predictive phase. And I, I know you've got some of that in your paper. And interesting enough, that is very similar to asset management models. So if you talk about in the engineering sphere, they have a lot of that sort of wording as well. You kind of get the base in, you go into, you try and manage your reactive, then you get into the proactive and then you get into the predictive. So you're kind of managing breakdowns, then you manage them better, you can react to them better. And then you start predicting when those breakdowns are going to happen based upon your data. And then you kind of, the next level is you go to like world-class where you integrate all of those. So lots of similarities I found with your paper and engineering. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I think it's an interesting point you raised that uh, taking into consideration some potentially external boundaries that you can work within. I would sort of see it from maybe the other perspective. And what we do talk a little bit about in the paper as well is perhaps having um, of reduced minimum boundaries under which uh, you can just use those prescriptive guidelines. So, um, for example, um, I guess tightening those outer limits and then saying, okay, well, if you want to go beyond that, that's when you need to start looking at a risk-based approach yeah, yeah, to yeah. managing that. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to work up to eight hours in a row, great, feel free. You don't need any additional management strategies, but if you want to be working up to 12 hours or beyond 12 hours in a row, that's when you need to start bringing in that sort of FRMS approach. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's an excellent point. Yeah, it's not saying you can't go above them or beyond them. It's about if you go above them and beyond them, these are the, these are the additional controls you have to put in place. So if you, can't, yeah, exactly. if, you can't, if you can't eliminate using like the hierarchy of control of safety, if you can't eliminate those hours of work or that extended work, here's what we need to do. We need to you know, bring in extra people to allow more breaks. We need to bring in technology to monitor people, you know, whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's layering those in. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point um, with, I guess, just identifying what FRMS is generally. I think it's not about saying you're never going to be fatigued, let's eliminate fatigue. It's about saying okay, well, people are going to be fatigued, particularly in shift working industries. There's no yeah. real way around that. So let's identify it and manage it so people can be safe even when they are fatigued. Yeah, and that, that, that again is an interesting point because I, I, you've reminded me of, I gave a talk um, within a mining company, uh, oh, must have been, I would say it was good 11 years ago to a lot of executives. And one of them who was quite, educated in engineering went, yeah, well, that's all well and good, but surely there must be some sort of tablet that people can take. You know, we've, we've become that advanced with medicine that we can eliminate fatigue. I went, you're kind of referring there to things like modafinil or types of speed, really. I said, yeah, they'll help people overcome. I said, there's lots of research on that, like military activity. They'll overcome short periods, but it doesn't promote or allow for long-term adaptation. Like, you know, and you explain that whole thing that we are diurnal animals and we're meant to sleep at night, meant to be awake during the day. So, unless you can completely flip the rhythms of life and the world into a different solar system and completely invert everything, you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, have pure, perfect vigilance and attention at nighttime when working shift work or in these periods, because that's just the way we're designed as humans. And I don't know if there's, there's no way really we can engineer that unless we take people and, um, you know, manage complete light exposure and don't have them, interact with the rest of the world is probably the only way we can do that and who's going to want to sign up for that job that's like a mission to mars job for three years you know so you know it's very um it's very hard to do you know yeah that's a very good point that's a very yeah. good point and <laughs> yeah i think um it's a mistake some some people make thinking oh well people that work permanent nights they must just be adapted but you kind of forget that there's a whole whole spectrum of life outside of work time so you know as soon as you have a day off then that all gets flipped on its head and Exactly. Yeah. And then we see all Everyone's like the, going to be wanting to maintain that. That's for sure. Yeah. And then you see all the negative aspects associated with permanent night shift from individual health, to long-term health, sorry, short-term individual health, to long-term health impacts. And then as you said, social community, you know, the whole lot. I, I've seen people have worked permanent night shift and you know, they're, they're like zombies really. They just constantly look 
tired and fatigued and I do a lot of training with guys who are shift workers and you see them coming off night shift even the next day and they're like gray in the face you can and especially when you're doing like a combat sport you can feel the difference in the energy of that person on that day but when they're well arrested they're far more attentive stronger rack better but even like a short like two night shifts and they come in then after a four or five hour sleep they can really see the difference in it yeah i think i've uh, i've met one person who did permanent night shifts who seemed really well adapted to it just like just one you know like yeah, yeah. all the people that i've spoken to and everything and she was a nurse in um, a hospital in victoria and she just had her whole life set up around these permanent night shifts and she thought, you know, it really worked really well from like a childcare perspective and, you know, for her social stuff, it kind of fit in really well as well. Um, but yeah, one person. So I don't know, there may be a bit of individual differences going on there and how you set your life yeah, up, yeah. but yeah, overwhelmingly, I, I couldn't do it. You know? we'll, have to, we'll have to take a sample of her brain and implant it in everybody else, else and do a little brain <laughs> transplant so we can adapt. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's not a real thing. If anybody's thinking that's a real thing, I'm just joking. <laughs> Uh, it's called taking the piss. Uh, Madeline, in your uh, review process, um, your search strategies were quite, kind of interesting. You use a term that I've seen a lot recently, but many people may be not a, uh, aware of it. So when we do these systematic reviews, you obviously go through all these databases like you know, Google Scholar, for example, or Medline or Scopus or Web of Science. And you kind of go with all these search terms and you come down and you've obviously outlined the search terms here. But you've also gone through a gray literature search strategy. What, what's gray literature? Uh, so grey literature essentially refers to literature that's outside of the sort of peer-reviewed journal articles. So um, we thought it was particularly important to include other kinds of documents in this review because a lot of what we're talking about is the impact of FRMS on industries and organisations. And so a lot of grey literature is going to be, you know, reports from certain companies or guidelines or um, anything sort of in that industrial space that hasn't gone through that rigorous, uh, you know, academic peer review process. Uh, it's a really difficult thing to include in something like a systematic review, though, because there's no one repository where all of these yeah. types of documents are held. Um, and so that does introduce sort of an element of bias. Like as we mentioned in the paper, there's, there's not really any way around that. Um, you know, we can do our best to look through all the databases that we do and do know of and use, you know, industry contacts and what's available, you know, just on the web generally. Um, but it does mean you're just trying to get all the information from those industry sources you can. And there's not a real way to do it in the systematic way as we think of with a normal systematic review. Yeah. So what was what is interesting that you may have found that great literature that may have not made it into the paper, just even anecdotally. What 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 was what was you was there anything surprising in that that was really different than the published literature? Um, I don't know about necessarily specifically different from the published literature, but it's more the perspective. So a lot of what we found in the grey literature was sort of um, you know internal guidelines and policies and procedures that actual companies are using. Um, so it was interesting to see. I guess that combination of FRMS with the prescriptive systems. And we did see that, you know, coming from those industry sources. So that sort of has informed some of what we talk about in the discussion where um, we talk about how those hybrid approaches might be preferred by industry. Cause it does seem like that is what some of those industrial sources are saying. Yeah. Hmm. And when you looked at all these different, cause obviously when you search all these things, like you said, it was healthcare, there was, you know, firefighters, it was whatever. Would there be any group in there that you think would be leaders, best practice that you would kind of go to, to, uh, you know, steal and cheat from and say, these are the best. I'm going to kind of look at what they're doing. Um, I think probably some of the most advanced uh, systems that we saw were uh, in the aviation industry. Um, so in particular, a lot of the guidelines um, from, you know, international aviation organizations are already taking sort of an FRMS risk-based approach in ways that other industries aren't. Um, so I think definitely them. Uh, it was also really interesting looking at um, sort of the transport industries and how they approach things differently. And I think um, a really good example is just the Australian heavy vehicle uh, industry. So um, documentation from the NHBR here in Australia, um, which includes uh, various levels of compliance and or risk-based approaches that you can take. So I think that's a really interesting source to be looking at as well. Excellent. Now you've organized your findings here into kind of three groups, I would say. Well, this, is what, this is what I found from it, which I found probably really interesting, was the predictive, the proactive and the reactive that we've just spoken about. How would you describe 
the elements of the reactive bucket, if you want to call it that, or the bin? What, what's in reactive? Uh, so I guess just to provide a bit more context about what those three terms mean. Yep, yep. So essentially the predictive, proactive, reactive are three sort of levels or points at which fatigue can be managed. So the reactive specifically is about what an organisation is going to do in response to fatigue or incidents or accidents or, you know, in any sort of situation that's already occurring within that company. So that's things like incident investigation particularly. Um, and so sort of acting in a reactive way rather than a proactive way as the name suggests. Okay. And then, so we got in the reactive area, we have incident investigation and fatigue importance. This is like basically after the fact or something's happened where people have exceeded an hours, hours of work or they haven't complied. Um, or even in some ways they may have had like an audit, an external audit could even be in there as a kind of a finding or a, or issues that are very much based upon the past as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it, it, it's a particularly important part of an FRMS to have those sort of ways of looking back at what's actually happening within the organisation because yeah. that's how that sort of uh, continual monitoring and evaluation component of, a, of an FRMS can happen as part of that feeding the data back into the system so that um, the organisation can learn from it. Because you know, that's a really important part of FRMS that it's a you know evolving thing. It's not just saying, well, we've got it right immediately and that's it, let's leave it. Yeah, 100%. And I often, in, in my sort of applied consulting work, I often look at other data sources as well across health and safety and, and HR, people-related stuff as well, to look for that reactive thing where you see like maybe across the year there's been high absenteeism, we've had you know high sick rate, whatever it might be. Um, and these are all areas then, because obviously you talk about defences in depth, um, to use Kirsty McCulloch's model and Drew Dawson's, and it's obviously been kind of aligned with the James Reason model from the Swiss cheese stuff in 1997, which basically talks about if you don't have en enough staff at the start, you know, you're basically going to be in this kind of a, a tailspin or a loop. If, you're, if your staffing is down by 20%, you're going to just kind of induce revoke fatigue in the 80% of the staff that's left. So it's about getting that right as well at the start. Yeah, that's a really interesting point to bring up. That just makes me think of, you know, everything that's in the news at the moment about how all of our healthcare workers yes. are, well, and lots of industries are down so many workers at the moment because people are in, you know, COVID isolation and everything. And how, you know, there's not really a way to manage fatigue at a certain point, uh, you know, super effectively at least, when you are down 20% of the workforce. Yes, and sometimes you just cannot get past. I have got some companies I work with when I'm like, if you have an FTE on like a full-time equivalent account of a hundred people, but you only have 60 people employed, you're just going to have fatigue issues. So at the base level, but now it's about what controls or what strategies can we put in place to help them. It's not saying we can't do anything, but it's like fundamentally until you fix that problem, we're just doing containments or band-aid solutions. You know, we're just we got to we got to wait till we get get the surgery, but these are the things we can do in the meantime. <laughs> but until until you get that, you got, you got two options: either recruit the people or redesign your work processes. Because yeah. and and try and lower your headcount through redesign of work. But you're just always going to have that issue. So you you know you're not going to get out of jail free. You can't continually keep doing it because then what happens is the people that get fatigued. If you start doing that long term, what happens then? People go, well, why why am I going to work here? I'm just wrecked the whole time. I'm working like eighty hours a week. And it's never ending because not recruiting people. I did my best for six months and this is what happened. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's a really uh, good point that then kind of feeds into the proactive component uh, because a lot of the proactive uh, side of things is about that sort of modeling and planning in advance to try to avoid those sorts of outcomes. So um, particularly in this review, a lot of the proactive um, component that we looked at was, or at least we have found a lot of papers on it, um, was on things like biomathematical modelling and how yeah. that can be used to do those sorts of things like workforce planning. Like, what, what is this going to look like from, you know, a bit of a bird's eye view? Yeah, I think the proactive area here is really interesting because um, what you've spoken about here is like prior sleep-wake behaviours, alertness management, education, self-assessment, the use of light, performance measurement, and so on. But the one here I really like that you've used, the wording, is fatigue detection technologies and the word detection is key for me because i think that so many people think by strapping on a fitbit or a wrist worn technology or putting some sort of device in the cabin of a cab of a truck or in a life vehicle or whatever it might be 
that oh we have a technology that's that's our like i've seen people go that's our fatigue countermeasure i'm like so how does that work well because it tells them that they're fatigued yeah but how does that work and you go because all it's doing really is providing you with data and it's providing you with early warning systems it actually does not eliminate fatigue and i think again come back to my medication example too many people think that the technology is a silver bullet and Mm -hmm. a classic example is since the invention and the deployment of the weighing scales in everybody's bathroom, have we, you know, cracked the obesity epidemic? Or if you want to call it that, you know, <laughs> that people call it the obesity. I don't know if it's classified as an epidemic or not, but the obesity problems that many countries face. And I would say we haven't, if anything, we're going the other way. So the weighing scales has not actually lowered people's weight. Um, overall, maybe for some people it's helped as a measurement tool. So why do we think fatigue detection technologies and the keyword being detection will actually improve people's sleep? Because again, we're seeing that sleep is still being impaired regardless of technology application. Yeah, and I think that's something that's definitely coming up in industry at the moment, where a lot of companies are bringing in different types of fatigue detection technology, but then they don't actually know how to integrate that with their system. Um, So, you know, just for example, if you have, you know, seeing machines or, you know, some other technology in your fleet of trucks and, you know, they're giving you alerts that your driver is tired, you know, they've had some eye closures or, you know, whatever it is that that particular technology is identifying, what do you actually do with that information? What does that trigger and how do you actually manage that? And just to correct myself, I think I said proactive when I meant uh, predictive rather when I was talking about modeling. I was more talking about that original step before then getting to the uh, proactive. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah, we'll, to, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, jump, we'll jump to that bucket in a second. But I think yeah. um, I, I think that there could be an argument that modeling is proactive as well because you can use – actually, to be honest with you, I think, Madeline, that you can use modeling at all of those levels because you can actually use some of the models to do incident investigations. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And I guess, I guess just when I was talking about sort of workforce planning, that's where I yeah, would see yeah. it probably being at that predictive state. But then, yeah. no, you're absolutely right. And even at the proactive point, being able to look at a specific individual's modelling, I think that can play a really big role there. Yeah. But, you know, to figure out how many people you need in your workforce, it's probably going to be a bit too late at that point. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's an argument that it can be, it can be used across all of those levels. Um, just to give you an example of what you brought up on the same machines as an example, this is actually a really interesting point, and I'll, I'll blow the trumpet of my consultancy business here because, um, because it's all published in the domain. Um, so there's a little bit of a case study on our, over on our website, Amelia's Consulting, um, that people can look at. That was the exact problem, Madeline, that we did with Anglo Gold Ashanti, um, down in Tropicana Mine in the gold fields in Western Australia. They had seeing machines on their caterpillar trucks in mining, and basically they had all this data, and then they were like, "Wait, now this is getting worse." what do we do? So we actually set up a program with them where we worked with a local sleep physician here in Perth in Western Australia, Dr. Jack Philpott at Sleep WA. And we set up a system where we basically pre charted the data every month about the number of alarms or where were those alarms happening, like on day shift or night shift, whereabouts in the cycle of the roster, and then the people who had the highest alarms. So again, using a risk management strategy, Who's the person that has all of these alarms, right? So we were kind of constantly looking at reducing the risk with people because we found the old 80 20 rule again that 20% of people were responsible for 80% of the alarms. So we put in a process where we did some pre screening with them, looking at, you know, demographic factors and anthropometric factors, sleep disorder questionnaires, and so on. And then um, we used uh, a level three PSG on site, uh, ResMed one, to basically you know, detect the prevalence. And we were like 95% accurate of diagno- with, with sleep WA of identifying and then consequently diagnosing people with sleep apnea from that process. And that wasn't a punitive process. That was like, okay, you have sleep apnea. Here is a management plan. Some people decided to get CPAP, for example. Some people decided to, to lose weight. Other people made some changes. And we had over a 40% reduction in risk which is quite significant because all that reduction in risk increases your uptime or operating time, which allows you to be more productive in the mind side as well. So there's that kind of bigger benefit to, you know, you can actually help people lower individual risk, decrease organizational safety risk and increase productivity as well. So there can be this multi-benefit dimension to doing these things, but it's just interesting. You brought that specific example help me prompting you before the podcast, <laughs> because we had to solve that exact problem for a business. So yeah, it's 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 a it's a really good example. 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting to think about it, not just in terms of identifying those individuals who might be more at risk or certain routes or certain times of day or all these kind of risk factors, but I think it's also important to think about what that person actually does practically when they get the alarm in the moment. Yes. And I think that's a kind of a key component that's often missing as well. You know, do you pull over after the first alarm? Then what? How do you get back to base? Yeah. Or is it two alarms? Or, okay, does one alarm mean you pull over and have a coffee? Or, you know, like what, what are the actual practical strategies and how is that being managed uh, at a you know, personal and organisational level? Yeah, and to come back to your point earlier on about people just being tired on night shifts, you know, a lot of companies are like, oh, we're having all these alarms between three and six o'clock in the morning. I go, yeah, that's normal. What do you mean? I'm like, it's normal. That's like the lowest point in your security rhythm at 24 hours. I'd be surprised if it wasn't there. And they yeah. kind of go, oh, okay, so it's okay. It's okay, yeah, yeah. So like, sometimes like applying that science to an operational environment, it kind of gives the operation leaders a reassurance that what's happening is actually normal, that it's not completely gone the other way as well. Again, this is why the key word here is detection technologies, which I think is is a great is a great addition in there in the middle, um, mm-hmm. because people t- view this as the silver bullet. You also yeah. have uh, predictive in there as well, Madeline. So what what's the predictive aspect? You got hours of work, biomathematical, biomathematical models, breaks, and health screening. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess when we think about predictive, uh, I guess countermeasures or components of an FRMS, it's really taking that step back and sort of looking as the name suggests, again, in a predictive way. So what can we predict about what risk we're going to see based on things like hours of work um, and also, you know, individual risk factors, so that health screening. Um, So you'll see there in the paper, we didn't actually find that much on breaks for health screening, really, um, which was quite interesting. Um, But a lot of what we did find was on the hours of work. And I think hours of work is a really interesting one because, you know, we can both conceptualise it as that sort of predictive strategy you know if people work less hours they're probably going to be less fatigued so we can control fatigue to some degree in that respect but then also as well as being that sort of part of an frms it really is just part of a prescriptive system generally and there are lots of systems that rely on that as their only fatigue management strategy yeah and when we talk about breaks we're talking about breaks within the shift we're talking about breaks between the shift and we're also t- talking about then breaks between the roster cycle so some yeah. people might you know, work seven days on, seven days off, that seven days off is a break. But I think also as well, we have to be careful when we're scheduling breaks because there's an assumption sometimes or an implied assumption that people are sitting down resting. Some people might have another job and that's seven days. Yes, that is <laughs> right. a very interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> you know, so some people have a second job or other people might go home to a, a household that's probably busier than work. I've heard a lot of men and women said, ah, I'd rather be at work because it's not as bad as, <laughs> as I've been at home. I've got three crazy boys aged between seven and 12 and it's just constant chaos. So there's all those things as well it needs to be taken into account. Um, and it's all those like external factors um, that come in. Mm-hmm. Or classically we see as well, even people in managerial roles that have these odd working hours where they might come in at seven and finish at four or five, could sometimes be until seven or eight, but then maybe like, you know, studying, doing a master's in the evening as professional development or trying to study on the weekend and got kids as well. That in itself is just an accumulation of working time for, for that person. Um, and then that can also lead to fatigue as well, even though they're not on, you know, a classic shift in roster pattern as well. Yeah. And I think that's where some of those proactive measures, like, like just wearing a Fitbit or something like that, can actually be quite a useful strategy just in terms of monitoring your own sleep because there are so many factors external to work that can impact your sleep and fatigue and it can impact how you go at work. So, no, I think it's a really important point that organisations need to think about, with yes, work time, but also non-work time. Yeah. So, Madeline, here, here's a kind of an off-the-cuff question for you, which just kind of popped up in my head, um, which is, over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of changes to the workplaces happening for shift workers and what's we'll say day workers, when I call it that. And one of the things that I've reflected on that we need to build into FRMSs is, is actually the scheduling of meeting times um, from a Zoom perspective, like you and I today are on Zoom doing a podcast, but how do we schedule it, especially in multi, um, multinational companies where you got someone up at like three o'clock in New York and it might be like five o'clock in Sydney, whatever it might be. And um, that's kind of an element that I've started to introduce with some people. Uh, in, in in businesses because you know it's always one or two people getting absolutely you know screwed in terms of meeting times rough at like yeah. three in the morning <laughs> so how do we build a model that we can kind of share that um distress around <laughs> and um 
I know it's so everybody gets a taste and I know it's not that good as well, which changes some people's <laughs> behaviors. But now since you publish this paper and the way the world has gone with lots of changes, is there anything you would have added in or you would recommend that should be looked at as part of an FRMS going forward? Uh, well, I mean, I guess considering differences in time zones is also something you can think about in terms of FRMS. But, you know, to be honest, I think a lot of that is sort of encapsulated in the sort of tracking and like devices and modeling and all these sorts of things could be used to capture those sort of novel working environments. Yeah. And I think a lot of what is about it is an FRMS is about is about looking at what's being done and then feeding learnings from that back into the system. So I think, you know, if we were doing this now and we were thinking about, um, you know, Zoom specifically and the impacts of COVID on, you know, working from home and this, that and the other, you know, they're things we could think about, but they're not inherent differences in the system itself. Yes. They're sort of things that the system can be used to manage. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think you make a very good point that it's uh, important to share the love in terms of the uh, <laughs> undesirable, shall we say, times of the day for meetings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, that, that's my, always always my advice to somebody in like a managerial or professional role that's working with shift workers is like, before you start, you know, screwing around with people's working time and shift, go and just do two or three night shifts. You don't have to do like, you know, seven or eight night shifts. Go and just do two or three and see how you feel because you might be a little bit more empathetic to, to people doing that. And so, you know, it, it'll really change your mind on, um, you know, what, what goes on because, um, yeah, it's one of the reasons I don't do shift work. <laughs> yes, I don't do it either if I can possibly avoid it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't like it whatsoever. Another reason why I don't want to work in a lab either because you have to stay up overnight watching people sleep. That's why I like <laughs> more the, the chronobiology world, the applied application of sleep science into the into the world. You can just work during daylight hours. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I was fortunate enough that when I, I did a lab study for my PhD, but I was fortunate enough that... Um, uh, the protocol that I was doing was a lot of overnight sleep and daytime, um, like testing and stuff. Oh, so right. I got the day shifts. Fortunately, that worked out nicely um, for me. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did a couple of lab based ones in mine mm. as well. And I remember like getting up the next morning, people getting up and going, and they were like, "Oh, do you like doing this?" I said, "No, not really." I said, "This is why I left the military. <laughs> like, I, this <laughs> this stayed awake at nighttime crack is not for me. I don't I don't want to enjoy it at all." Yeah, I always say that my brain turns off about 10 p.m. So uh, I try to avoid it where I can too. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, <laughs> so Madeline, what, what are some of the barriers that are in place for people trying to implement these FRMS, FRMS systems? Because they be they are FRM, well, fatigue risk management systems, um, because it can be quite daunting for small companies, mid sized or even big companies to look at putting these in. So what, what do you foresee as the, the barriers to implementing these in a the business? I mean, I think the sort of two, I guess, main categories of barriers, um, but also enablers, you know, I guess barriers enablers are sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, uh, sort of the practical barriers are enablers, so particularly things like cost, um, and then also sort of uh, culture. Um, so, for example, things like uh, does the company operate under a shared responsibility framework and do they have a just culture and, you know, how advanced are they in terms of that organisational culture in terms of fatigue reporting? Uh, our workers feeling that they, uh, you know, are, are they going to be treated differently if they report fatigue or they going yeah. to be punished? You know, all those kinds of cultural things can be really important to consider as well. Um, so I guess essentially what we found uh, was that if companies don't have a, a, you know, advanced sort of safety culture, you know, not necessarily just to do with fatigue, but with, you know, other safety aspects as well, then it can be a bit of a bigger leap to implement an FRMS uh, because a lot of what that is, is based on that shared responsibility. So the organisation taking responsibility, but then also putting trust and responsibility in the workers. Um, so that, that culture there is really important. But on top of that, as I said, the other side of things is, is really the cost yeah. um, and the sort of resources required to manage and implement an FRMS. And that can be a real barrier, particularly for sort of smaller organisations or industries where there's not um, support at the regulatory level. And then another question that people people ask is like where should I start with an FRMS and I always say I actually look to exercise physiology for this answer and strength and condition because when you work with an athlete people go like oh what's the best training program you know you know should I lift weights three times a week run twice swim whatever and the answer is again is like it depends what do you like doing and so with companies as well as like where should I start and I'll always say where do you think the problem is and also where do people in the business think the problem is? Because if it's just about education initially, 
we should pull on that thread and we should pull on that thing that people like and we should educate people. And we should, because then you might get a mass way of going, oh, actually, after all that education, we should work on shifts and rosters. But vice versa, if we've got a shift and roster problem or a staffing problem, like we said, we should be looking on which one of those that the business has the appetite to pull on. Now, that's my experience and, and, and sort of how I do it. Do you have another or any alternatives to start an FR mess within a business that we could do in a more systematic approach? I mean, I think you make a really good point that just sort of starting where you can and actually just making that first step is a really critical thing. Um, and I would add to that that, you know, consulting with the people who are actually mm. in the roles that are affected is a really important part of that because, you know, it's all well and good for a company to say, right, we're doing an FRMS now, yeah. everything's changing. But if you don't actually have that buy-in from, well, I guess the worker and that the managerial level, then it's going to be really, really difficult. So I think starting the conversation there is really, can be really helpful. Yeah, and some companies are reluctant to do that because they're afraid of pushback or kickback initially. But I think in the companies that do it really early are the companies that get the most acceptance. The companies that try to design a lot of work and then bring it to the to the to the people doing the work for ratification or feedback, generally then we get ourselves in a whole consultation, change management tailspin for months on end. And we lose a lot of goodwill um, yeah. from people as well. And we don't get that buy-in engagement. We should bring people into the tent sooner rather than later, because then what we do is we, create, we, we end up creating this division. Oh yeah, management in there working on this thing, not asking us, we're the ones doing the job. What do you care? You go home at five o'clock. So I think it's a really important point that we bring people in really early on the journey. Mm. And yeah, it might be hard and you might get swore at and people might want to throw something at you and they might want to, you know, call you a shiny arse and someone who comes in here wearing a suit and doesn't know what we do. But, you know, just go in and take that and, and get engagement because that is that is key, I think. So it's, it's a really key aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's the difference, I think, between actual genuine consultation and sort of a consultation in name only where, you know, you're doing it because maybe you have to under the legislation your organisation operates under or whatever. Um, but, you know, if you're just doing it as a box ticking exercise as opposed to actually hearing the feedback and actually integrating mm -hmm. that into the system as you're developing it. And like I was saying with the night shifts as well, even if you, if you, particularly if you don't know the industry, try and do what we would call like a go look see. And this is very much you see this a lot in Toyota management production systems. So lean manufacturing people would probably know it as one of the key aspects there is when you have a problem, the first thing you should do is go look and see, because we could be talking about two different things. And I've yeah. seen this as well in my own experience. It's like, you know, oh, there's a problem with X, Y, Z. All right, let's go have a look. Okay, what's the problem with that? And you're pointing at. No, no, I was talking about that. I was talking about the one over here. And like, oh, okay. So we had like 10 hours of discussion about a problem that were actually two different problems, but now we're sort of aligned on what the actual problem is. So go mm -hmm. and look in and see what the problem is, but also as well to understand the process and the and the drivers of the business is 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 key as well. Um, so any chance you get to do that is is really beneficial. And it's good fun to get out there and see what's going on um, from a perspective in a manufacturing plant or in transportation or aviation or in mining. It's all it's it's all good and and there's it's it's all learning and it's uh, it's never going to be wasted and it's it's generally good fun. I think you got a lot of respect. You get a lot of what I call it street cred for going out and doing that with people as well when you engage. With yeah, them. definitely. And not to mention that for you know people like you and I, it's really fun to get to go visit a site or whatever. Get get out of the office or get out of the home office as it is at the moment. You know. I yeah, I, I, I'd like yeah. to go somewhere else in mine sites, though. I've probably seen enough mine sites. <laughs> I did some work a couple of years ago at um, some sewage treatment plants. So oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's better or worse, but it was certainly an experience. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I've been in one or two. It's it's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's funny for them because they're watching you gagging and they don't even register. <laughs> the people are like, oh, what? And you're like, <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> I think I did it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so so Madeline, what's next in terms of uh, research for you? What are you what are you working on? What's exciting? What's coming up in 2022? Um, what I'm most excited about at the moment is a project that I'm working on looking at uh, fatigue-related driving risk uh, in new parents. Oh, so, yeah. So That's really uh, cool, yeah. Some colleagues of mine and I uh, did another systematic review that i um, sort of working at the moment um, that identified that there's a real lack of research in um, certain vulnerable populations 
uh, in terms of driving risk. So, you know, there's so much literature and so much research out there on how shift work and night shifts mm. affects, you know, fatigue and driving and blah, blah, blah. But there's this whole population who are having, you know, really short sleep opportunities, really broken sleep and high levels of daytime fatigue. Uh, but there's just nothing addressing that. And we don't actually know the scope of the problem and we don't know, um, you know, can we maybe apply the lessons from fatigue management within organisations to this other vulnerable population? So uh, that's, this, doing at the moment. No, that's that's really interesting. I got, I got asked that actually on the weekend at, at my local gym and I, I don't really, oh. I got asked about the driving risk for parents and also then about, you know, helping kids to go to sleep. And I was like, well, first of all, I don't discuss paediatrics because I never win. I just get in trouble. Yep, fair <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I spoke at a, a thing called Toddler Fest years ago and loads of people come up and ask me questions about sleep, about their kids. And then the minute I start answering, people got mad at me. But my kid is good. I'm like, I'm not questioning your kid's behavior. I'm just, you asked me a scientific question. I'm just telling you. And I swore <laughs> never again. I'm just like, and then people start like, you know, do you even have kids? What would you know? Do you look after your kid? Like, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, you just asked me a scientific question. I, I, I don't, I'm not getting into it. So, so then, you're saying it's good that I'm focusing on the parents, not the kids then? <laughs> you, oh yeah. I, I would never touch pediatrics, but yeah, it's too immortal for me. And I, I yeah, it, that's, that's, you know, I think I'd rather go and try and retrain as a physicist as, as opposed to do that because it's too hard. <laughs> but the driving risk is a really interesting one because um, I do talk about that to people and talk about, you know, managing sleep. And you talk about this fragmentation overnight, getting up um, and going to try and pick up kids or drop off kids and then go to work during the day. You know, both men and women are doing it really hard. I'd say probably more women than men. So it'd be interesting if you were looking at the differences in terms of gender, who's who's most affected. But um it's it's really it's really high risk you know when you talk, think about the difference there I'm, i'd be really interested in that so is, is that systematic review being published or is it out uh, it's under review at the under moment. review i'll be really interested to see that and maybe if you're willing to come back on and discuss that because that is a question i get asked a lot and a lot of people will be interested in that yeah for sure and um yeah. we're actually doing some data collection as well so we've got that review that's under review at the moment and um, uh, we're doing some data collection at the, collection at the moment. Um, we've got some new mums who are wearing activity yeah. monitors and completing sleep and driving diaries and those sorts of measures. So hopefully we'll have some actual data to come out later this year. Yeah. And yeah, as you said, I'm hoping to sort of expand it to new parents who've gone back to work. So not necessarily looking at gender differences because, you know, there's mums who are back at work as well as dads and plenty of uh, non-heterosexual couples who I don't want to exclude. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's really interesting about the work versus non-work. So I think there's a question of exposure to driving risk that I'm particularly interested in sort of that bed being the next step. So, you know, I'm, I'm imagining that, and again, we don't have the data yet, we're collecting at the moment, um, that new parents who are the main caregiver who aren't working, their sleep is probably more disrupted, but they're probably less exposed to driving as opposed to parents who are working who maybe get a bit more sleep overnight, but then don't really have a choice about whether they're driving to work or not. So I think there's a question of how do we apply sort of a risk assessment framework to that, including work and non-work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's interesting because like you say, there's not much out there, but it's a big problem. So yeah, it's a really exactly. practical, um, practical thing to look at. Yeah, I might write a consensus statement on this to actually highlight the countermeasures against this, which I have been... Uh, using over the last 20 odd years, which is just don't have kids. <laughs> It'll be a one line consensus statement. <laughs> nice and snappy. Nice. nice and snappy. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the consensus statement. Line one, don't have kids. Thank you for reading this consensus statement. For more information, contact me, which is a nice segue into Madeline. If people want to contact you, follow your work, maybe uh, get involved in your studies going forward or just keep up to date with what you're doing. How can people follow you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter at mspracer, M-S-P-R-A-J-C-E-R. Uh, on Twitter. Um, uh, you can also follow me on, you know, all the normal places, you know, ResearchGate, etc. cetera. Um, and if you want to get in touch, uh, you can also uh, just email me. Excellent. We will put all those links down the bottom. Are you on LinkedIn as well, Madeline? I sure am. Excellent. We'll put links in for Twitter, ResearchGate, LinkedIn, and an email address. And uh, yeah, we'll let people follow you up and Hopefully someone out there has got lots of money and wants to fund your research. And which will that be would be great. That would be great. <laughs> we're, we're yet to have one of those people, but we know you're out there waiting. So this could be the project <laughs> for you. Madeline, have a great day. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much.